Hello, Howard County. My name is Ilsa Mir, and I'm the president of the Howard County Association of Student Councils. And my name is Griffin Divin, and I have had the pleasure of serving as the student member of the Board of Education for the past year. As my term, unfortunately, comes to a close, it is almost time to vote for your 2017 to 2018 SMOB. Joining us today are the two SMOB candidates, Anna Brady and Libby Milano. You will have the opportunity to ask some questions about their platform and learn more about their goals. If you're watching at home, you can tweet your questions using the hashtag HokoSmob, and we will try our best to get to them as soon as possible. Each candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to each question. You will be voting for these candidates at your school on April 26. Please pay attention so that you can make well-informed decisions. Without further ado, let's begin with our opening remarks. Hi, my name is Libby Milano. I'm a junior at Mount Hebron High School, and I'm excited to announce that I'm running for SMOB. Over the past two months, I've traveled to many Howard County middle and high schools to learn more about the issues that matter to you most. I've heard common concerns over things like our dress code, race relations in our school, diversity, and school start times. My goal as SMOB is to amplify the student voice and to empower you to take a more active role on the county policies that affect you. I look forward to meeting many more of you and believe that together we will be able to ensure that the student voice will not be ignored. Okay. Hi there. My name is Anna Selbrady. I am a junior at River Hill High School, and as you all know, I am running for student member of the Board of Education. So I have already had the chance to visit every single one of your schools at least once already, and now I am really looking forward to hearing your questions and being able to answer the questions about what matters to you most. So just as a preview, my platform includes three parts, school atmosphere, communication, and student representation, and I'll be happy to expand more depending on what you ask me. So. Um, thank you, and here we go. All right, so for your first question, who is your role model and why? I think that I have a lot of different role models, but specifically in the area of student leadership, I would have to say that my role model is Eric Gersey, who's currently serving his second term as the Montgomery County Student Member of the Board of Education. He's done an incredible job of creating town hall events, uh, posting videos about what's going on at the Board of Education, and connecting with students in a way that I haven't seen other SMOBs do before. And this is especially exciting because uh, Eric Gersey has chosen to support my campaign for student member of the board as his official choice for the best candidate in Howard County. And if elected, I'm hoping to serve in a way that Eric has and under his leadership to continue some of those great things that he's done in Montgomery County and ensure that the student voice is heard in Howard County as well. So my role model would be my ninth grade English teacher, Mrs. Martin. So she is my role model. She's also my mentor. I have. I come to her with questions all the time. I have cried in front of her too many times, and I probably shouldn't have said that out loud. And really, she's an amazing person, and I am so happy to be able to talk to her. But really why she's my role model is because of her leadership style. She doesn't consider herself a leader, but she really is. What she does is she looks at every single person she works with, and she says, this is what you're good at. You are amazing, and let's use this to, make, to work in a team and then do the best thing we can. So every person has a different has a different strength and something that they can do that someone else can't. So she is really able to bring that out of a person and bring that out of each person in a group so we can all work together and then things really can happen. Tell us about a project or accomplishment that you consider to be the most significant in your school career. Sure. So uh, for a few I served two years on the Maryland Youth Advisory Council. So what I did through that is I actually went to Annapolis and testified in the Maryland House and Senate on multiple bills for student member of the board voting rights. One actually was to get full voting rights for Montgomery student member of the board. At that time, it was Eric Kersey, and I testified after him, actually before him. And that bill was actually passed, so I was really able to be the student coming to the House of Delegates and saying, hey, I care about this, I think it should happen, and it happened. So that was really exciting. I also, through that, was able to get an internship with Delegate Trent Kittleman in the Maryland House of Delegates, which I think is really amazing because I'm still able to maintain that connection and learn about issues impacting students in my county and in my state. All right, what is the most important? Oh, <laughs> Libby, your turn. Thank you. 
So I think that a lot of learning happens and a lot of um, things have occurred for me in school with SGA and other extracurricular sports and clubs. But I think that also a lot of my best experiences have happened outside of school and have been things that maybe I wasn't always expecting. I've spent the past few summers traveling to uh, Denver, San Francisco, and Baltimore to work with at-risk youth, the homeless population, and people uh, working to escape human trafficking in those areas. And I've spent that time uh, meeting with people, hearing their stories, and connecting with them. And I think that uh, that's really important because it puts a face on these issues. And when we're back in Howard County, uh, I hope to use that experience to show the members of the board that the issues that students in Howard County are facing has a face and that students can come to the board and share those ideas correctly because it's not just statistics like we deal with with homelessness, but these are real issues affecting real people. All right, thank you. Now it's my turn. What is the most important attribute or skill that you believe you would bring to this position? I believe that the relationships that I've developed uh, will probably help me the most. I've served the past two years as our youngest ever president of the Howard County Association of Student Councils, and that's allowed me to meet with Dr. Foose and members of the Board of Education and host board luncheons where I've been able to connect with them personally. And I think that that will help me as student member because when I come into office on day one, I already have those relationships and have those connections to be able to work closely with those board members. And I don't need to start from the beginning because I've been working for years to develop those connections. Uh, as HS as HCASC president, I've also been able to be involved with previous SMOBs, um, and I think that that's helped me to learn from them and develop relationships that will give me experience in SMOB before I even step into office. So the attribute or the skill that I think would bring would be the best use for this position is that I have a passion to use policy to make a positive change. It's a mouthful, but really, the student member of the board before every meeting gets a binder with about this much paper that they get to read, this much paper that they get to read, all of it. And that is all of the information on what they are about to vote on. That paper, that packet, for some reason, I will really enjoy reading it. I have spent last year, all year, researching through the independent research class. I researched the wellness policy. And so I actually enjoyed looking at this policy, reading it, understanding how it works, and then analyzing how the theory turned into the implementation. So as SMOB, you will have to do a lot of reading and a lot of analysis, and I'm really looking forward to understanding more, not just on the wellness policy, but on more policies as they come up. Right. Um, what are your goals for increasing student representation on the board? Awesome. So that is, student representation is one of the three main parts of my platform. And so I have two main ways that I want to do this. First, I want to visit every single middle school, every single high school, every single education center in, the, in Howard County. And so that way I can directly link to students and say, hey, I'm student member of the board, hopefully, and I want to know what you think about what I'm about to vote on, and I also want to know what's wrong with your school, what do you want me to help fix? But that will take all year because it is 35 plus schools. So I want to create a SMOB advisory council, which is actually what they have in Montgomery County and they are working on in Hartford County. So I have the connections to make that happen. That will let me meet with students once a month so I can see, so I can get their input on what I am about to vote on right before I vote. A lot of the students that I've met over the past few weeks have been really excited about student leadership, but they haven't known how to connect with our SMOB or the Board of Education. And so I think that it starts with mirroring what Eric has done in Montgomery County with town halls at schools and advisory panels, but also letters going out with report cards or videos to keep kids in the loop about what's going on at the Board of Education. But those are very simple solutions, and I think that we can even go past that and empower students to come and share their, their experiences directly. Uh, I would love to see as SMOB every public hearing that occurs at the Board of Education to have at least one student there sharing an experience from their high school because I am excited to represent every student, but we all have different experiences and I think that it's even more powerful when we empower students to come here and to share those ideas themselves with the Board of Education. All right, this question is from Sean from Longreach. In regards to recent issues concerning discrimination at schools across Howard County, how would you respond to other incidents of that nature? And how would you promote school-wide unity if you are to be elected? So I attend Mount Hebron High School where one of these first major issues happened in Howard County and that was a very big deal because a lot of times the issues with race relations and diversity in our schools um, can be ignored and pushed under the rug, but this wasn't something that could be ignored. And so I'm excited that I was able to be a part of a group of students at my school that started discussions with Dr. Foose and the Board of Education so that we could address these issues and make it clear that this is something we need to talk about and we need to address. And from that came videos that um, at my school that worked to 
to dispel stereotypes and um, support other people. And I believe that that's something we can do on the county level, even preemptively, so that before any of these uh, conflicts occur, that we know that conversations about race and diversity in our schools are positive things, uh, and that we should support it and not ignore it. So, yay, diversity and inclusion is the first part of my three-part platform, is part of the first part of my three-part platform. So, specifically for if something comes up, I really want to commend Griffin on what he did this year. He wrote a letter, it was beautifully written, and he posted it to social media and everyone worked out, and people throughout the school system also posted it. So it really got around and it was this great, great voice of the students saying, here's what happened and here's what I think about it and what I think everyone should know. So that is really great and something I would want to continue if it happens again. Another thing that I want to do as the student member of the board is make sure that the board can provide the resources for every school to move forward in di addressing diversity and inclusion in their schools. Because lots of schools can do different things and they're all at different situations, but I think that they should be able to reach out to the board, reach out to the central office and say, hey, I want to try this, how can I do it? And then actually get an answer. Okay, um, this is from Rishi from Centennial. Um, what will you do for middle schools, particularly to ensure they feel as represented as high schools? Yeah, that's really important, especially because the middle schoolers are a great part of our county and they will become the leaders soon thereafter. So uh, part of that is really within my student representation portion of my platform because I'm not just reaching out to high schoolers to visit schools. I really want to visit every single middle school. And in fact, I already have visited every single middle school this year in some form, whether it's SGAs or student voice groups or Girls on the Run, which was really fun. So another thing is through the SMOB Advisory Council, I will be able to have middle schoolers on this council. So that's really important. And I think another part of my SMOB Advisory Council is that working on getting the applications, I don't want it to be terribly exclusive. Because if someone has an idea or wants to contribute, they should be able to. So that will also help to make sure that middle schoolers can participate. The issues that middle schoolers face in our county are similar to high schools, but there are a lot of issues that our middle schoolers face exclusively. And uh, I genuinely believe with the students that I've met that they all have ideas of how to improve these things and how to improve their middle schools, but they don't have the connections or the ability to communicate with the board to share those ideas. Today, I was at Lake Elkhorn Middle School, and we spent a lot of time talking about issues that they are experiencing in middle school. And a large thing that they talked about was how the wellness policy is affecting them, but even more than that, um, not being able to have water bottles in their classrooms, which is an issue that we don't deal with in high school. And so I think being able to listen to these students and then share with them the ways that they can connect with the board, the fact that if they email the Board of Education, the board is legally required to open and read what they have to say. This, these are powerful things, and a lot of times we forget to empower uh, middle school students, even though they have ideas that are just as powerful as our high schoolers. All right. The next question is from Avery from Patapsico Middle School. Collaborative leadership is one of the most effective forms of leadership. Can you talk about a time that you collaborated with other leaders to affect change? So speaking of middle school, when I served in my first policy review committee, I was in seventh grade, and what we were tasked with was naming middle school number 20 in Howard County. Uh, and that school ended up becoming named Thomas Viaduct Middle School. But on that committee, I had my first opportunity to work with adults in our school system, directors of departments, and the director of middle schools as well, uh, to go through this process and go through the very difficult decision of naming a school in Howard County. And I think that um, collaborative leadership in that area was important because everyone was representing different constituents and different views, uh, but ultimately we had to come together to decide what the best name was for the school in Howard County. And I'm really excited that there's a concrete example of a change that occurred in the naming of Thomas Viaduct Middle School as a result. So my, one of my favorite days of the year, it sounds ridiculously cheesy, is Homecoming Decorating Day. So I've been at Homecoming Decorating Day since freshman year. I was president freshman year, vice president sophomore year, and I'm still continuing with my SGA. And I love Homecoming Decorating Day because SGAs come together with like these pieces of different stuff. I don't know about your school, but at my school, River Hill, we decorate a hallway. And so there are tons of different pieces that come into this hallway. And you have to put the palm tree over there and the beach balls up on the ceiling. And everyone came in with their own piece of paper mache something, like the surfboard. But it all comes together there because we are working together to make this happen. It makes me really happy. That's what I love to do. So I love that question. It's kind of like what I talked about my role model, Mrs. Martin. So that's what I really enjoy. And that's, that's my example. Where's my phone? 
<laughs> um, this is from Michelle from Howard High School, and she says, if you could initiate or undo a single piece of legislation at any level of government, what would you choose and why? That is deep. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, let's see. This is on the spot. If I could initiate one. Okay. So I think something really important to me is mental health and awareness of mental health and what's going on in, with students, especially right now, and the stress that's happening in our schools. So <laughs> I'm going to call out my brother. My brother has depression. And so like, he's clinically depressed. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. Like, we know. We know what that is. But it's a lot harder to deal with than we think. So one of the things that I've been talking about that I want to do, and I don't really know how yet, but if I could magically create legislation, it would be to help with more awareness. Where if my brother emails a teacher and says, hey, I need to get this, I need another day for this assignment, the teacher will actually understand and be able to help him with that instead of just saying no, because that's happened. So that is one piece of legislation that I would want to work on. In terms of legislation that I think would be important to change, I'm going to stick to the Howard County level because that's the area that I think as SMOB I'll be able to have the most influence on. And I think a big piece of legislation that I would love to see uh, written differently or changed is our wellness policy. Uh, and actually I came in last summer with our former member of the Board of Education and executive board members from HCASC to testify and ask for the Board of Education to bring that policy up for review early. And I talked about the unintended consequences that they had on decreasing fundraising because students weren't allowed to sell pizza or baked goods after school to raise money for their clubs and the difficulty that uh, was posed to students when they weren't able to have honor roll celebrations with pizza and ice cream. And ultimately, that testimony uh, encouraged the board to change the implementation procedures and create exceptions to this rule so that our students were better represented. All right. What do you think is the most important trait in a leader? I think the most important trait in a leader uh, is being able to magnify other people's ideas and to use the skills that you have to help other people. Uh, I spend my summers working for Maryland Leadership Workshops where I'm able to lead students from across our state in learning things such as public speaking and facilitation uh, and other areas of leadership. And I think that that's really powerful because as a leader myself, uh, I'm able to use my skills to help other people realize their potential and develop skills so that when they go back to their schools and their communities, uh, they can use that. And I think that Leadership uh, is great to connect with other people and to spread what you know to help others. And I hope to do the same thing in my position of SMOB. OK, yeah, I could talk about this forever. It's the same thing with collaborative leadership. It's, I think that the best trait in a leader is seeing what other people can do and working with that. Instead of trying to make someone be good at math, why don't I work with the person who's good with reading? That's what I want to do, and that's what I strive to do as a leader. That's really my entire answer. I am really think that the best leaders are the ones who work with the group they have and are able to bring out the best in them as individuals. Matthew from Ellicott Mills Middle School asks, how do you plan to help and encourage, encourage kids to voice their opinions and concerns? So that's back to student representation. I think the best way to do it, because I know students are busy and I know you all have homework to do, and I know I had a lot of homework to do even in middle school, is to reach out. I am physically going to walk into your school and say, hi. I'm Anna Brady. I'm your student member of the board, hopefully. What do you want changed? What's wrong with your school? And what do you think of what I'm about to vote on? This way, I know you have stuff to do, so I'm coming to you. I want to know what you think, and I will be able to talk to every student in that school through an assembly or through coming during lunch. And that's what I'm looking forward to doing. As student member of the board, you only have a vote on the issues that are decided before you step into office. So we know that school start times next year will be discussed, but um, if there are issues that we want to deal with with wellness policy or other areas, that may not be something that I have a vote on. And so I think that it's important to empower students to come in and share their experiences and their ideas on things that may not even be voted on. And I think that uh, informing students that if they email the Board of Education that the board is legally required to read it. And if students want to come in to testify in front of the board, uh, clarifying that process for students and assuring them that board members are required to listen. And not only that, but to send them a letter after their testimony uh, with their comments and feedback so that students can ensure that their voices are being heard and that uh, the ideas that they're expressing aren't falling on deaf ears, but that there's a concrete example of the board listening to them and responding to their ideas. OK, here's a fun one. If you had a superpower, oh, no. what would it be and how would you use it? 
Uh, being in the middle of junior year, I think I would have to be able to say time travel. Uh, that would give me enough time uh, to run for SMOB, to do my homework, and all of those other extracurriculars. Um, I also love to travel and to go different places in the world. I'm excited uh, that I get to travel to Uganda, Africa this summer, and that would maybe make my trip a little bit shorter, so definitely time travel. Okay, this is short. I would love to be able to fly. It would be really cool. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Um, now, I'm going to ask a question, and this one's actually for myself. Um, if you are the student member and you are faced with a controversial topic or time on the board, how do you plan to stay focused the whole time and always make sure that the student's best interests are being put first? Of course. Well, the student member of the board, we all know, is the student member of the board. It's this, I'm the only person who would be on the board representing these students, the ones who are actually in school and the decisions being made for them. So I really think if something happens, I can make that clear to the board. I can sit here and say, hey, as a student, let's talk about what we're actually talking about. Let's not get into the politics of it. Let's not go back and forth with each other if that's not actually what we're trying to do. I can say that, and I know for myself, with my vote, whatever I'm doing, it's not going to be based on someone else. It's not going to be based on the drama that's happening. It's going to be, I have talked to the students. I have talked to my advisory council. I have talked to the schools and said, hey, what do you think? And now here's what I want to do and here's what I have decided. It's not based on something else. I think that we see, especially now, a lot of conflict within um, our school system and our Board of Education especially, uh, and it can be really heated and very controversial. As a student member, I believe that it is my job to not be involved and uh, to set an example when even when adults uh, may not be behaving like adults or may have conflict, as a student member, to be able to sit back and be a positive example of professionalism and to represent students at the highest level. Uh, students uh, should not be represented by me being involved in arguments, but instead uh, staying strong to my beliefs and the values that I know that Howard County students hold uh, and remaining professional throughout um, those debates and I believe that that will also set an example for the members of the Board of Education and Central Office to see uh, a student working as an example of professionalism and maturity. How will you work to increase the role students have in school decision making? I think that that's a big deal and a lot of that starts with uh, our policy review committees and I think that um, Every policy review committee includes students on it, but many students who are passionate about these issues aren't aware of how they can get involved or how they can be on these committees. And so I think as a student member, using my platform to ensure that more students are aware of how they can get involved and how they can have an impact before these policies even reach their schools is very important. I also think helping students develop strong relationships with their administration and their staff uh, and working through the clubs and organizations that they're already involved with will allow them to make changes in their schools. When you have strong relationships with adults, that allows you to make changes and to work with them cooperatively um, on the same level. So I'm going to use an example. Today I visited Lime Kiln Middle School and we spent like 45 minutes discussing the wellness policy and they were like, why is this happening? How does this work? What on earth? And I was like, I spent a year on this. Here we go. So. <laughs> Uh, one thing that we talked about was the fact that they used to, last year they got ice cream if they got on the honor roll. This year they don't. And they were mad about that. And I said, yeah, believe me, I would be too, I was. So then I pointed out that there is actually an exception that was changed this year. So you can have a party with that honor roll ice cream. It's just that the principal probably didn't know about it or didn't understand it because the policy wasn't as clear or it wasn't communicated properly. So something that I'm working with these students to do now is let's get it changed. We can talk to the principal and so now I'm going to work with them to reference the policy and then we can be able to change that so at the school level impacting their decision. I just lost my question, sorry. Um, <laughs> Radhika from Centennial asks, what is one positive and negative quality your friends would use to describe you? <laughs> oh, okay. Positive quality is that I am a team worker. I do not do anything like for myself on my own. If I'm doing something, I'm working in a group, I'm working with other people because I believe that, I, that other people are extremely more valuable than I could ever be on my own. So that's what I work, that's what I can do and that's how I think I will succeed the best. Negative quality, ah, oh, um, thinking, thinking, I, take on a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I take on a little bit too much. It came up this year and I was like, okay, wait, no, I can't do this. And so next year, my goal is not to do that as much. 
I think a positive quality that my friends would use to describe me is determined. Um, when I set my mind to do something, it's going to happen. When I was in sixth grade, I decided that I was going to run for student member of the board, and since that time, I've been working to get ready to run, and um, my determination got me there. And uh, as for a negative quality, I am a very, very talkative person, um, and I love public speaking, but for my friends at least, uh, that can get a little bit tiring for them, but hopefully that will be of some use on the board. All right. Even though you cannot vote on the budget, what is one area where you would advocate or lobby for more funding? I think an area that we've seen um, some controversy with is the funding for um, our ESOL para-educators para this year. Um, and I know that students uh, from my school, Mount Hebron, uh, lobbied the board and wrote emails to them and attempted to testify here uh, to express that we need to have funding for our special education students and for our students in ESOL programs uh, that are just coming to America or um, struggling in our schools. And I think that that's an area that we need to accommodate. And, um, during my campaign, I also had the privilege of visiting Cedar Lane School, which helps students uh, with disabilities and um, learning struggles to learn in their own way and to learn in a specific environment. And I think that uh, funding for those programs and for students that aren't always represented and that can't come in and share their views uh, with the Board of Education themselves, that that's an area that I hope to, to lobby for funding for. Yes, visiting Cedar Lane this week. Um, that's a really important thing, so yes, funding for paraeducators and that other side. But uh, one of the things that I don't know if it counts as budget and like a, the budget work, but I know this year there were issues with teachers not getting paid properly. And that, if I could vote on it, if I could do something about it, is definitely what I would address first. Because the teachers should be able to get what they need and what they deserve as amazing teachers in our school system. Okay. Elizabeth from Bonnie Branch Middle School asks, describe a time where you had disagreed with an adult and how did you handle the situation? I don't know if he's still here. Is Mr. DeFato still here? <coughs> this is my example. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm president of my SGA right now. Uh, well, I stepped down, but I was president of River Hill High School SGA. And one of the things that happened, it was kind of small, but it was still a disagreement. I thought we should do a coat drive because the PTSA asked and my advisor said, no, let's not do the coat drive. It's homecoming, let's not do it. So what, we, what happened was, it was a little awkward at first because I didn't really disagree with him for a while, but then he was like, okay, fine. You run the coat drive and keep homecoming up and then it'll work out. If you can get it to work, that's great. So what I did, it worked, it actually worked. I worked on, I asked my vice president Rahul to work with me and we did the coordinating, we sent the emails and we made sure that that coat drive happened and homecoming happened as well. Uh, this year I've had the opportunity to serve on a policy review committee that's changing the way that we select our SMOB candidates next year and is actually introducing a convention uh, to pick the two candidates that you would see here next year um, and to involve more students in that process. But during that time a lot of different options came up and there was a large group of students and adults that were sharing their feedback and one of the concepts that was discussed was having three candidates for a student member of the board instead of two. And some members, um, adults, believed that three would be positive and uh, personally I I think that um, maintaining two candidates for SMOB would be the best option. And so luckily in that policy review committee, we were able to talk through that and discuss and then ultimately ended in voting between those two options and selecting to continue with uh, two candidates. But it was a civilized discussion over an issue that both of us cared about. All right, this question is from Sophie from Centennial. How do you plan to both continue the work of prior SMOBs and to change the role of the student member? So for the past three years, I've had the opportunity to work very, very closely with um, all of the student members that we've had in Howard County because of my work on the HCASC Executive Board. And so I think I've seen what has worked very, very well, and I've seen uh, some of the mistakes that we've made or learning experiences that our SMOBs have had. So I'm excited to have had that experience because that will allow me to continue with some of the great work that Griffin has done using social media and participating in HCASC meetings. Uh, but it will also help me to stay away from certain areas that were tried by former smobs and maybe we're not as successful. Okay, so Patrick a few years ago did school visits and I thought that was amazing and that, that's where I started with my platform. Another thing, as I mentioned, where Griffin sent that letter and I think that's brilliant. That's something that I would definitely continue regardless of the issue that comes up. As for the future, uh, what 
Through my internship in Annapolis and through my experience testifying in Annapolis, I actually would be really excited if I could work for full student member of the board voting rights in Howard County. Because I, we worked on it and it happened in Montgomery County, it's already there in Anne Arundel County, and I would be able to work with Delegate Kittleman to see if that can actually be a possibility, because I will be continuing next year. Okay. Rosa from Oakland Mills High School asks, what's a specific policy, other than the health and wellness policy, <laughs> are you interested in working on and changing? Okay, so it's a little annoying that the policies that we will actually be changing are not what I get to decide on. Griffin decides on them. So I get to choose another policy, regardless of, okay, actually I changed my mind. What I would want to work on is actually what is going to be happening. And I guess it's not as much a policy. It would still be school start times. Because we've been talking about it, I've been talking about school start times a lot with tons of different groups as I've been visiting them. And we know that last year, the Board of Education came out with five options for school start times. And the board voted this year and has decided that middle schools and high schools will start between 8 and 9.15, and that's set. But now, I'm really looking forward to working on actually coming up with the pieces of the puzzle to make that happen. And that's what I'm looking forward to changing so that students will be going to school a little bit later, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, as you step into the role of student member on the board, uh, the agenda of what will be voted on that year has already been determined before you mm -hmm. enter. So uh, you can only vote on what the board has decided to allow you to vote on. But we know that an issue that will be coming up again is the small policy uh, that I was discussing earlier. And I think that that's very important. The way that we figure out how do we implement this and how do we host a first ever convention with students from every one of our middle and high schools to make sure that uh, all different backgrounds of students' voices are heard as we select our SMOB and how do we support SMOB candidates as we go through this process? And that's a policy that I'm very, very passionate about. And I know that if elected as SMOB, I will be working very hands-on with that policy because um, we'll be writing a handbook to guide principals and administrators on how to select these delegates and then being at the convention and being able to advise potential SMOB candidates um, on their performance. It's known that great leadership is not about the number of followers you have, but it is about the people you develop into fellow leaders. Can you talk about a time that you helped develop leadership potential in someone else? Absolutely. So that's a really great question. And I think that that's something we see a lot, especially through organizations like the Howard County Association of Student Councils. And I think um, a very proud example of that for me would be Avery Klein, who is an eighth grader at Patapsco Middle School. Um, I've been able to watch Avery since the sixth grade develop into the leader that he is today as he served on the executive board of our state uh, student council, which I'm excited to have said that I've helped him uh, run that campaign. And he's done an incredible job this year on that board. And I think that seeing Avery develop as a leader and work with best buddies in his school and plan events there and also communicate between HCASC and MASC, I think uh, that's been a really powerful experience to see him develop on his own and to be able to serve as a mentor for him as he develops as a leader. So, um, like, spoiler alert, I'm a triplet. Everyone's is like, whoa, really? So I'll say that now because I'm going to say that I think the people that I get to mentor, which is kind of weird but really cool to me, are my siblings, my brother and my sister. And I'm specifically going to talk about my sister now. So uh, we went into freshman year, I ran for class president and I won. We went into s sophomore year, I ran for vice president and I won. And then junior year I stepped down. But now what's happening is I've moved away from class SGA and my sister, and I, my sister is now taking over and I'm really proud of her. She is going to hopefully run for vice president next year. And we've been working together since freshman year to work on class SGA activities and work on fundraising. And she's always there helping with me with emails and everything else. And so I'm really looking forward to her now taking on her own role and becoming the vice president, hopefully, of our class SGA. Madison from Oklahoma Mills High School asks, school administration is constantly changing. How do you plan on strengthening, strengthening the communication between administration, students, and teachers in spite of this? That is a huge, huge thing. That is kind of my second, the second part of my platform, which is communication. And that's really what I learned with my research on the wellness policy. I know you heard it a million times. But what I, what I did when I researched it was I read about the theory and how it was actually good, even though I thought it was quite bad. And then I analyzed how that theory didn't turn out in the implementation because of communication between the policy, the board, the, parent, the administrators, and then the students. So there really is a gap between the administrators and the students. I think a lot of that is 
able to be fixed through announcements from the administrators to students. So one thing we have at my school right now is a student community where my principal can now send out an announcement that all the students will see on Canvas. So if something happened, like a change in the wellness policy, she will send that out and then the students can see it immediately and not hear something from a rumor, but hear it from her directly. I think it's important for us to have discussion between our students and our administrators and to acknowledge on the school and county level that students have ideas and they want to take a stake in improving their school and county communities. Um, for me, when we were dealing with uh, the racial video that came out at Mount Hebron High School and began to have voice circles with students from all different backgrounds in our school, our principal was in attendance and was a part of those conversations, even as we still talk about it today and decide how to move forward as a school. And I think that that's a really positive example and something that could be mirrored in all of our high schools and middle schools to allow student leaders in our schools to engage with their principals and their administration despite the fact that they may be changing uh, to keep those lines of communication open. And then also easily for students <coughs> in lunch shifts and in the hallways as they pass administrators to be friendly and to start to develop those relationships so that when you need your administration, uh, they're already familiar with you. What deficits do you see between regular and GT classes, and how do you plan to reach out to students that you don't regularly talk to? That's a big issue. So to address the first part of that question, um, I think that even the way that those students uh, in different levels of classes see themselves in the school is a, a really negative thing. And the way that um, some of our students perform in regular level classes because maybe of the encouragement of their teachers or um, the supplies that are provided to them, I think is a large issue. Um, I also believe that uh, the demographics between our AP and GT classes and our regular level classes um, is a big issue that should be addressed in our county and to make sure that uh, minority students make it into our AP and GT classes and are encouraged to succeed and are encouraged uh, to excel at those levels um, despite uh, difficulties right now. So that difference between GT and non-GT classes is actually something I talked about when I was a facilitator at the Youth Town Hall with Voices for Change, which was really interesting because I talked to kids from Oakland Mills Middle School, and I really had never talked to kids from Oakland Mills Middle School before. And we talked about how even at that school versus my school, River Hill High School now, there is still that, like there's a difference between the student who's in GT and Reg, and that's not that big of a deal, so why is there a difference? And that goes back to diversity. So for that aspect, it really goes back to having the resources for the schools to be able to let students come together and talk to each other. And actually, I talked at Hammond High School about that and today, where we talked about how they had a day where, a week, where students were working to come to each other and say hi and meet someone new and actually be inclusive and talk to each other. Okay, now it's time for another fun question. Kate Lachlan from Wild Lake High School asks, if you could be a shoe, what type of shoe would you be and why? <sighs> oh. That's terrible, because I have two favorite shoes. Can I do two? I'm going to do two. <laughs> My two favorite shoes are totally different, because I love running, and I love leadership government things. So I'm sorry, but I have to do two. <laughs> I love running cross country, so it would have to be a spike, because they're so cute. They're so little. Um, they're really light, and they have the spikes on them. So they're just perfect for running, and I think that's really amazing. But then I also love the pump, because I'm short, so I like being a little bit taller. And I also always feel really professional in them. So it's really nice to just put on that shoe and feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more ready for what you're going to do. And I'm very happy with my new ones right now. I think if I were a shoe, I would probably be a pair of Converse. Uh, not only because those are the shoes that I wear most often, but because, as I found out, you can wear them with almost any outfit. And I think that that's... Uh, how I see myself as a pair of Converse in the sense that uh, I can interact with students playing sports, in clubs, involved with the arts and drama, uh, involved with SGA, and that's going to be an important skill as I travel to these schools and meet other students. And Converse can be worn professionally if you walk with enough confidence or very, very <laughs> casually. And I think that that's important as a student member to be able to be professional with the board. I won't wear my Converse to a board meeting, but also to be able to be casual and approachable as you meet with students. What would be your primary channel of communication to reach out to students on a day-to-day -day basis? I think a big thing uh, would be social media, but I would love to change the role that uh, we use our SMOBS social media. I would love to create videos after each board meeting, keeping very simple what happened at the board, uh, how it affects you, and the changes you're going to see in your school. I think that developing that and pulling back the curtain, so to speak, to allow students uh, to get involved with the board, and maybe that doesn't mean sitting through the six or seven hour meetings, uh, but it does mean uh, 
being able to understand very simply what's going on and why it's going to matter to them. And then I think uh, also sending letters out to schools with report cards, updating what's gone on with the board that quarter and how you can get involved and contact me to share your ideas will also be very crucial. Yeah, so first as a shout out, <laughs> a student at Hammond High School came up with this idea and I think it's really smart. So there is actually a spot on the Board of Education website where it talks about the student member of the board. And then it has a spot where it says, contact here, type in your, what you want to say to the student member of the board if you want to, here. And then it says, closed for comments. So to begin, I want to open that up. So if a student goes onto the Board of Education website and wants to get there, let's do that. But then also there is social media where you can Instagram message me, you can Twitter message me, and I'm happy to reply. And then last thing, uh, something that I talked about also with the same student is having either a video on the morning announcements after a board meeting or a newsletter as well, where it just bullet points. Here's what I decided, here's what happened, and here's how it affects you. You've both talked about the importance of reaching out to students around the county. But now, how do you plan to reach out to kids who may not be as involved in student leadership? So that goes back to part three. I really want, and I plan to, and I think it can happen. I can visit every single high school, every single middle school, and, say, and stand up in front of the whole school, not just the SGA, not just the students who are involved in this club that I got to visit, but stand up to the whole school and say, hey, what do you think? Another thing that I can do with that, just off the top of my head, because a student might not want to stand up and talk, because that's a little scary in front of the whole school, is to have them send in, a, send in something to me later. Put, if I put up my information, put up my Instagram, and you can Instagram message me what you think later, so that it's a way for someone to contact me about what they think without having to speak up out loud in a huge meeting. Uh, in the past two weeks, I've sent a video, a very short one, to each and every middle school in our county to be played on their morning announcements, and I think that that's a very powerful way to approach students and to make sure that you reach all groups of students. I genuinely believe that students, whether they're in involved in leadership activities or extracurriculars or not, uh, want to improve their school environment and want to improve their experience in Howard County each and every day, but a lot of times they don't know how or they don't know where to begin. So I think getting the position of SMOB out there and making it approachable and available for students through morning announcements uh, is a very great way to start, and that encourages students to reach out to you directly or to at least recognize your face when you come to visit their school and feel more comfortable to speak to you. What was the most unique community service activity you've been a part of? Sure, so when I spoke earlier about my experiences in San Francisco and Denver and Baltimore, I think the most unique experience that I've had was in San Francisco when I was handed a bag of sandwiches and was told, okay, go give these to people and talk to them. And that was a very, very terrifying experience for me to be in a city that uh, I had never been in before and be asked to approach uh, strangers and share a meal with them and hear their stories, but that's been an incredible thing uh, for me and something that I've been able to continue as I traveled on uh, different trips to be able to meet people and uh, start the conversation with a meal, but end up hearing a story about their life and the struggles that they're going through. And although it doesn't come with a concrete outcome like some community service activities, uh, it creates a relationship and it helps people to feel heard and I believe that that's a very, very important aspect of community service. So definitely the like weirdest community service thing I did is a commercial, but I didn't really realize what I was doing until I got there. So I knew I signed up to do a commercial for to help show the dangers of sugar sweetened beverages and how it's actually hurting you, especially in Howard County. And so I, I knew that, but I got on this bus with my brother and with Madison over there, and we got on the bus and went and were driven to DC, like DC, in the center of DC, and then we were told, okay, now walk into the building, there's a security guard, but just say, I want to go up, and they were like, no, you can't go up, that was really awkward. And then we were sent back out, and then we blew up this big beverage can, like it's huge, it's like the size of this, really, really tall, and we were videotaped the whole time, and then we ran around a building like 20 times, it was really weird, but I don't know if you saw the video on your social media. Basically, <laughs> that was to really highlight the dangers of sugar-sweetened beverages, and I can say it worked. <laughs> How will you work to empower students and address the achievement gap? And address the achievement gap. That's very specific. So I wish I could say that I could create a policy that was like, all students are amazing, all students should have the ability to achieve well in classes, and 
fix the achievement gap. I can't do that. I can't even decide which policies I will be voting on, which is a little disappointing. But what I do think I can do is the student member of the board does have a presence, especially through social media now. And I think that is something that I could do a little bit more with awareness. Um, in addition to talking to other students and saying, hey, you're cool, um, being able to show that that's still an issue and that that's still something we need to address and talk to the board about it, bring it up more often, that's just a little way to make sure something happens even if I can't vote on it this year. Our Maryland state SMOB, David, actually has been working for this past year to address the achievement gap in all of our schools and with the State Board of Education. And I think that's something that should absolutely be commended. And his efforts can definitely uh, be mirrored in Howard County. I think on a more personal level, uh, connecting with and meeting with groups like Alpha Achievers and Delta Scholars in our schools to encourage those chapters and to watch them grow in each of our schools. Um, to promote minority achievement and hopefully address the achievement gap in each of our schools. It's difficult, like Anna is saying, uh, to address policy when it doesn't come before the board, but meeting with those students and encouraging them to address that gap in each of their schools and also encouraging students uh, who are affected by the achievement gap or who see that uh, in their daily school life to come to the board and to share that experience so that in the future the board will not ignore that issue and that uh, they will certainly discuss it. So I am the president of HCAST, and I know both of you have been very involved in the past with HCAST. Um, as HS president, my question to you is how will you use HCAST as a platform for your position as student member of the board? So when I started coming to HCAST, I was in the sixth grade, and that's where I met the student member of the board at the time. And he asked me my opinion on an issue that was going on in my middle school. And at the end of that conversation, he said, OK, I'll let the board know. And that was a huge deal to me and changed the course of my leadership experience after that because at that age, 11 or 12, no one had ever asked my opinion about what was going on in my school. And even more than that, no one had ever promised to take it back to important adults in our school system and to make sure that they heard what I was saying. And so I think that that was a very, very powerful experience. And during my time in HCASC next year, uh, I hope to serve in that same role to connect with students that don't feel that their voices are heard and to assure them that uh, I will take that information back to the board and share it with them. I think kind of like Avery's question, we're all going back to collaborative leadership. That's what HCASC is. Uh, HCAS when the SMOB, the SMOB election policy was revised, HCASC spent so much time working on coming up with solutions, some ideas on actually how to change it. And that's where this, so many students came together to work on revising the policy. Because at last meeting, I sat at a table with the other appointed officers and said, OK, what do we do? How do we make this work? And then we came up with something. It was like 30 minutes. I was really surprised. And it was, so HCASC is a great way to get some thinking done uh, as a group instead of just as one person. And I think as the SMOB, it'll be great to be able to come to HCASC and say, hey, how do we do this, what do you think? And then have a group work together and come up with a solution. Okay, and uh, now it is time for your final question. Um, so what do you believe is the most prevalent issue facing students in the Howard County public school system? It's huge, okay. I think the most prevalent issue facing students right now is going to be school atmosphere, which is broad. But school atmosphere for me is diversity and inclusion and stress and mental health. Those are huge topics, and I've already talked about them, really. And I think that every school has had, especially diversity and inclusion, something new come up that hasn't been very good a lot. And so students are starting to feel unsafe in schools. They're starting to feel even more stressed right now, especially with homework load and having to get up early in the morning. And I really think that's something we need to address, and hopefully I'll be able to do it as mom. Between issues like school atmosphere, diversity, and race relations in our school, and the way that the wellness policy is influencing all of our students, I don't think that we can say that there's one issue that is the most important in our county, because these topics affect each of our students differently. And we have over 30,000 students in our middle and high schools. But the way that all of those issues could be addressed and all of our different concerns is through amplifying the student voice. I don't believe that students know how they can communicate with the board or how they can get these ideas that they have or these concerns that they have uh, to be expressed 
expressed to adults and other students that can actually make a change in that area. And so because we are all having different experiences and struggling with different issues in our county, I think that amplifying the student voice and making sure that students know that their voice will not be ignored and that they have a place at the table when we're discussing improving our Howard County school system is the most important issue that's facing our students. Okay, um, let's give a quick round of applause for the candidates for answering the question. Um, that was a phenomenal 45 minutes of answering the questions, and we are going to finish with our closing remarks. Uh, each of you will have 30 seconds, and we are going to be starting with Anna. Okay. So thank you all for listening a lot for a long time, and I really heard some great questions, and it was great to answer what you really care about. So if we didn't get to your question, or if you have more, feel free to contact me. I will be handing out my flyers with my email, my social media, and my website, so please feel free to reach out. Um, so just to highlight tonight, we discussed qualifying experience, the wellness policy, school start times, middle schoolers, and a lot more. And <laughs> it was really great to hear what you really think and be able to answer it from my perspective. So I hope you will vote for me based on my leadership experience, policy knowledge, and passion for making a change. So I'm so glad to have gotten to talk to you and hear what you have to say. Please <laughs> vote Anna Silberti for SMUB. Thank you. I believe that it's not the job of the students to approach the SMOB, but that it's the responsibility of the SMOB to go to students. Mm -hmm. If elected as SMOB, I guarantee that the SMOB will become more accessible than ever before through town hall events and video updates. I've seen these methods be successful in Montgomery County through their SMOB, Eric Gersey, and I believe that through his official support of my campaign, we'll be able to make those same changes in Howard County. We have over 30,000 students in our middle and high schools. So imagine the impact that a well-organized, empowered student voice could have. I promise that my top priority as SMOB will be to listen to you, to empower you, and to advocate for you. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Um, and good luck to both of our amazing candidates. You can follow them both on their social media platforms, and I'm sure they're gonna be tweeting and Snapchatting, Instagramming a bunch tonight. Um, thank you to our cameraman, Mike Dubbs, who's put on this amazing live stream, which you are able to watch if you are watching online right now, or you're going to watch in the future. And thank you to Kevin Baker and the Bear Press for facilitating all our social media. We would love for all of you to come to our next HCAST meeting on May 10th at the Homewood School from 7 to 8.30. For more information, please follow us on our Instagram. All middle and high school students are welcome, regardless of their participation in their school's SGAs. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you on April 26th. Bye. Bye. <laughs>